Good morning and welcome to the Australian Rangelands Conference. Um, those of you who have logged on online, well done you. Um, you're ready and organised. Unfortunately, some of our uh, in-person guests are still checking in. So we're going to delay the beginning of the actual conference for about five minutes or just a couple more minutes. So I'll stay up here on screen so that you know everything's running smoothly technically. And we're just giving the um, in-person conference goers an opportunity to grab their lanyards and get a comfortable seat in the next couple of minutes and we'll be underway very shortly. It's really great to have you here. Uh, today, it's fantastic you could join us um, given the circumstances around COVID. Um, so you do have a couple of moments to grab that cup of tea if you hadn't quite gotten it organised, um, put the dog or the cat out, whatever you need to do. I'll be back with you shortly. Good morning and welcome to the NRM in the Rangelands 2021 conference. I'm Nicole Bond, your host for the next couple of days. 
I'm in Longreach on Ninengai land and would like to acknowledge the traditional owners past, present and emerging. And has, as has been the case for life since COVID-19 became a household word, we've had to adapt and we're delivering this entire conference virtually for those who couldn't travel to our corner of the rangelands in central western Queensland. It's the second time the Australian Rangeland Society has held a conference in Longreach, but it is the first time online virtually, and it's also the first time partnering with Desert Channels Queensland. Thank you to our sponsors who have supported this event and made it possible to produce the conference. Our presenting partner is Green Collar, and our gold sponsors are the Queensland Drought Committee and NRRA. To introduce the conference theme and to set the scene, I'm going to move over and make way for the immediate past president of the Australian Rangeland Society, David Phelps, and the CEO of Desert Channels Queensland, Leanne Kohler. Leanne has been the CEO since DCQ's inception. She's shepherded it successfully through the NRM landscape from Longreach, and she's lived in the rangelands all her life with a background in government. Dr David Phelps works with the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries based in Longreach. He's an adjunct professor at Central Queensland University, and his area of expertise is Mitchell Grass and Grazing Management. Please welcome David and Leanne. to say that you've not been able to hear the video. Uh, so we are just trying to fix that at the moment. It's off to a slightly shaky start here at the conference. We still have some of our um, local uh, attendees checking in um, and I'm just getting some signals from off camera. Okay, so you can hear the host very well. Peter, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you for giving me that feedback. I can actually hear myself in the main office too. Um, we are just holding fire for a moment while we sort out that audio issue on the video. Um, while we do that, um, I'm just going to uh, give you a little tour, those of you at home, uh, of the platform. Um, bear with me for a moment while I get organised for that because it's very interactive. We will be uh, running polls. We will be also asking, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions and there's even a feature where you can go and meet each other, those of you who aren't physically here in Longreach. I'm just conversing with our technicians in Brisbane uh, while we get that audio issue sorted out. Okay, those of you who have found the discussion forum, there's a lot of chat happening there, which is great to see. You might be able to help each other troubleshoot a few of those uh, in initial problems. I see Sarah Moles is online from the Australian Rangeland Society. Good to see you, Sarah. Thank you. 
just while we're getting ready to um, get that video um, up and the audio issue fixed, I wanted to let you know that there is an opportunity to go into the resource library. Um, in the resource library, you'll be able to find all the five minute presentations which have been done on some very interesting topics. Um, so make sure you put some time aside again for that. Um, there are over 20 lightning presentations um, that are all in movie file format. So be sure to pop in there and get that happening. I'm still waiting on confirmation for our video. What I'm going to do though, is I'm going to throw to our local resident and custodian of Inangai country, uh, Mr. Tony Weldon. For those of you who may have been in um, similar events in Longreach, you would be familiar with Tony. Um, Tony will um, provide for us an acknowledgement of country and so I would like to welcome Tony not to the stage but in this uh, virtual environment welcome Tony to the central box Thanks for bearing with us, everyone. It seems the system hasn't quite had its caffeine dose this morning, but I would um, be very proud to introduce Mr. Tony Weldon, a local resident from Longreach and custodian of Inangai country. Um, please welcome Tony to the centre box. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, my name is Tony Weldon, Inangai custodian. I begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land which we are gathered here today, the Inigua people, and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. As Indigenous and non-Indigenous people together, let us recognise the importance of the country on which we are living on today. It is a great pleasure that I welcome special guests, locals and those who have travelled a long way to be here for the Rage Lands Conference hosted by Desert Channels Queensland and the Australian Range Lands Society. And once again, welcome you to Inigo Country here in Longreach and thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, um, and you 
probably can't hear it from where you are, but um, a nice round of applause from those who were able to make it into the Long Reach Civic Centre here on what is a beautiful, bright, uh, cloudless day in Rangelands Country, Long Reach. Now I'd like to, we'll try and get back to that video later on, um, but it's great to have you here. We'll be drip feeding you information about how to use the platform as the morning goes on. I'd now like to introduce our opening address speaker, um, the Honourable Senator Susan MacDonald. She is no stranger to these parts, having grown up in Cloncurry, just up the road. Uh, she's going to speak to us this morning about um, the opportunity for industries of Northern Australia in the rangelands. Please welcome Senator Susan MacDonald. Hello and welcome everybody to Longreach and to the Rangelands Conference. A particular welcome to all the scientists, the ecologists, graziers, conservation managers and everyone else who's there to participate in this really exciting three days. Now I understand that the conference theme is shaping the future and what could be more timely and appropriate than talking about our future in these uncertain times. But it's also exciting because with the a rebooting of the Northern Australia agenda, where a significant amount of the rangelands sit, this is the right time to be talking about both Northern Australia and the rangelands. I grew up, as many of you know, on a cattle station just south of Cloncurry, right in rangelands country. And so I know the importance of the rangelands that they play in supporting a number of our important industries, whether it be beef cattle production, mining, uh, conservation, environmental activities, tourism. Uh, all of these can happen together. We can coexist on our rangelands. The rangelands region contributes $4 billion a year in beef grazing activities. And in addition to that, mining royalties, uh, tourism operations, uh, and you're in the heartland of some of the world's best tourism facilities right here at Longreach and just down the road in Winton. Uh, it's so critically important that these industries continue to prosper and thrive and support the thousands of people who live and work, the communities that prosper uh, in our regional areas and across the rangelands. We are living in an exciting time where new industries like carbon farming, biodiversity, uh, biofuels, uh, are all being developed and supported, some by the state and federal governments, some by commercial uh, users, by uh, jurisdictions across Australia and internationally. This is going to drive new opportunities for Australians to live, work uh, and be uh, prosperous in rangeland Australia. And in this new role of Special Envoy for Northern Australia, I know the importance of growing our communities, of backing our farmers, of backing mining projects, of fighting for cheaper airfares in regional areas, of additional services, medical and health, for aged care, for childcare services. All of these things make it possible for communities to thrive in regional Australia, right across the rangelands. And of course, connectivity, whether it be internet and digitally, or roads and rail, these are all critically important for moving people, uh, services uh, and commodities right across our regions. And it's our population right across both Northern Australia, regional Australia, uh, and of course the rangelands that gives our place heart and soul and meaning. I am passionately invested in supporting communities to stay and thrive living in regional, remote and rural Australia. And one of those communities, or one group of those communities, is our Indigenous communities. I'm really committed to ensuring that Indigenous communities are equally engaged in how we develop these regions and how they too can participate uh, in every opportunity that comes forward. But most of all, I know how important it is to continue learning about the rangelands and how crucial programs such as the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund the Northern Australia CRC, uh, the Future Drought Fund and Drought Innovation Hubs, all of these are to providing the resources needed for the science and on-ground management in the rangelands. 
I will do my very best to keep the rangelands, their management and scientific funding on the agenda in Canberra. You do wonderful work and you have my support. I commend the organisers of this conference for their commitment to have a, di a diverse range of opinions and views held at this conference, to make it a safe space for people to, ra to raise different issues, uh, for people to engage uh, both in person and like me today, remotely. Good luck. I wish you all the very best for the next three days. You have my support. I wish I could be with you and I know it will be a terrific conference. Thank you very much to the Honourable Susan McDonald. It's always great to have you um, in the region, if only virtually today. We are, you know, quite disappointed that some of you couldn't make it to Longreach to be with us in person, not only because it would have been so great to meet you face to face, but you would have been able to get to know our part of the rangelands as well. So we've um, done a little bit of something something so that you can uh, get your own taste of our part of the rangelands. Here it is. Welcome to the 2021 Rangelands Conference, hosted this year from the heart of the Rangelands of Outback Queensland. Outback Queensland is a great spread mosaic of diverse landforms from the savannas of the tropical north, the shallow lakes of the desert uplands to the rolling desert sandhills of the centre, from the vast Mitchell Grass Downs to the monuments of sandstone upthrusts and residuals, from Gidji Ridges to the beautiful Red Mulga of the desert. Vast and beautiful, with a sparse population. Outback Queensland is traced by a network of great and ancient rivers, nature's vascular system that waters the arid centre. Tropical rain from the north is spread through rich floodplains and wetlands that maintain environmental security and commercial production even when nature forgets to rain. Most of the outback rivers are endorheic in that they never reach the ocean, terminating in Lake Eyre or on the way. These rangelands have been home to humans for millennia. Today, settlement has brought scattered communities and tiny towns servicing large pastoral holdings. Small towns, minuscule populations holding tenaciously to a broad landscape. The main commercial interest of the rangelands is livestock production. The variable climatic conditions, what has been termed the boom-bust cycle, have brought management challenges. Seduced by good seasons, landholders race to take up huge tracts of the outback. But the outback had its own ideas. Explorers perished in what was a land of plenty. During the first half of the 20th century, southwest Queensland was known as Heartbreak Corner. Karkari Station ruins tell the story of that heartbreak. Purchased by Sidney Kidman in the late 19th century, Karkari was caught out by drought and 4,000 bullocks perished. Kidman abandoned the station in 1906, declaring it a failure. Today, with knowledge and the flexibility of road transport, this region is productive, where landholders now work with the variable climate. In the dry time, the road trains roll, destocking properties that are then restocked after flooding rain. And when that rain comes, the inland sea returns. The Cooper at Windora becomes an ocean.
But after the wet, inevitably comes the dry. And after the dry, yet another wet. Climate variability that can run in cycles of more than 10 years. And the variability of landforms and bioregions across the rangelands of outback Queensland bring challenges. The invasion of woody weeds and feral animals is an ongoing battle. Maintaining ecological integrity, commercial enterprises and working with nature are challenges for today and for the future. This is what this Rangelands Conference is about, an introspection into the natural resource management in the Rangelands. Come with us on this journey over these coming days as we collaborate to shape the future of the Rangelands. Isn't it just a land of majesty? There's nothing better than those sweeping drone shots. Thank you for that production. And I hope it made you all feel a little more um, here with us in the rangelands in this neck of the world. Now, Bruce mentioned in his video then about shaping the rangelands. There's a few ways that we're going to try and do that this conference. And one is by using our um, live poll feature. Now, if you look, I think, down to the bottom of your screen here, you should see some tools along the bottom. And what you'll notice is one that says live polls. Throughout the conference, we are going to be putting questions with multiple choice answers on there, and we would like you to take part. We will then uh, take your responses, collate them, and they will shape some of the sessions as the uh, next couple of days goes on. So it's important that you take part and shape the conference into the way that um, you, know, you think is going to be most useful or most beneficial to the region. So we are going to have a practice at this. Um, it's always good to iron out the crinkles early on. So I'd like you to go into the live um, poll and you'll see that there is a question there. And some of you have already been wonderful and filled it in. I'd like to know, where are you joining from today? Now, I don't need to know whether it's your lounge room or your office or out on the back deck. Um, I'd like to know what state or whether you're joining us from elsewhere. So if you could take your time now to um, click on where you're coming from. Looks like New South Wales is winning at the moment with uh, 36%. There you go, you can see it up on the screen too. So if you're having any trouble finding that live poll uh, feature, you could put something into the discussion forum, but essentially have a look down the bottom. That's where it is for me. I haven't seen what it looks like from your perspective, so hopefully I'm giving you the right instructions. You can make it full screen by clicking on the arrows on the top right of the image if you need to. So there's our poll coming in. Now the other feature we are going to use um, across the conference um, when the speakers, after the speakers have been giving their, giving their address, you'll be given the opportunity to ask questions. Um, and so if you go to uh, your right, you should see a little icon there saying live Q&A. If you click on the live Q&A, um, there'll be an opportunity or an ability for you to type in a question. I'll be keeping an eye on these and so will the other producers that are working across the streams. We'll be watching them and uh, we'll be forwarding your questions onto the speakers when they finish their presentation. So that's the area that you can participate by asking questions. Right now, though, I would like you to tell me or type in the uh, live Q&A, um, you've said um, what state you're in. I'd like to know what's the nearest town to you from where you are currently. We saw on the live poll that we've got 25% of people now from New South Wales, um, 17 percent are here in the conference hub in Longreach, 
31% in Queensland. So I'd love to know if you could type in the live Q&A. There we go. Peter Johnson's joining us from Brisbane. Thank you. Um, Carly, Drew from Townsville. Great to see you. Fantastic. They're all coming in now. So you, it looks like you guys are all over this platform and this system and we're really uh, shaping up to have a fantastic as integrated conference um, in this uh, modern world. Great to see you, Tom France and Jenny Milson, also in Longreach. Great. Keep your answers coming in. I'll come back to those soon. We're going to continue on uh, with the program. I would like to introduce the editor and chief of the Rangelands Journal, which is the Australian Rangelands Society's scientific journal. It's um, a fantastic publication and no doubt many of you have read a copy um, at some point or other. Paul Novelli is in our other studio in Longreach and I'd like to welcome him to the stage. Welcome, Paul. Thank you and good morning, everybody. As, uh, as stated, uh, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Rangeland Journal and we take the opportunity at every biennial conference to, in fact, introduce the John Mill Memorial Rangelands Lecture, uh, uh, a, a presentation by one of the people attending the conference chosen by the organising committee. And I guess there are always two questions asked in this situation. Firstly, who's going to present the lecture? But secondly, of course, some people ask, who on earth is John Milne? John Milne was my predecessor for the position of Editor-in-Chief of the Rangelands Journal. And John, it's fair to say, took the Rangelands Journal from very much a, an Australian uh, and society publication to an international publication. John had done the same thing with the Journal of the British Grassland Society. I don't know if those of you who remember back in the, in, in the 50s and 60s, you'd open up the Journal of the British Grassland Society and see pictures of people in long sleeve shirts and ties cutting um, pasture sampling uh, samples, mainly ryegrass and things. John turned that journal into grass and forage science, and it's now become a, a very well-respected international journal. And John did the same thing with the Rangelands Journal. And uh, we like to commemorate that, and uh, and it's on on his behalf that uh, this lecture is uh, is chosen. In terms of the Rangelands Journal, I would like to encourage everybody who is either in the audience here in Longreach or, in fact, uh, linking in on video, if you are either presenting anything or, or or a poster, please consider turning that into a a manuscript for the Rangelands Journal. And for those society members who get the journal you will notice that the, the uh, if you like, the front paper of the most recent issue one for, for, for 2021 was a paper by Turner and Friedel. And interestingly enough, this was a paper based on data collected outside Alice Springs in the 1950s. And that highlights the comment that's often made that uh, there is an awful lot of data sitting in filing cabinets and elsewhere. So I do encourage everybody who's got an old filing cabinet full of data, think about pulling out the data and writing a, a, a manuscript for the journal. Okay, the John Mill Memorial Lecture, this, this biennial conference will be presented by Ross Garner. Now we heard um, in the introductory video that this conference is about rangelands for the future. And one of the things that the future's presenting us with, of course, is climate change. Now there is uh, an interesting, uh, point here in that the first John Mill Memorial Lecture presented in Port Augusta in 2007 was presented by Professor Mark Howden of uh, ANU and Mark again spoke on climate change. Climate change is going to be one of those major issues with which rangelands and rangelands management is going to be faced and Ross Garner's uh, presentation is going to give us a fairly broad, fairly wide spectrum view of what climate change could will or perhaps might uh, present for the rangelands. It's going to give us, I think, a fairly different world. Uh, it may exacerbate some of the existing problems. It may make some of the existing problems more benign. We really don't know, but we do know it's coming. It's coming like a freight train and we better start thinking very much about it. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Ross and uh, his presentation for the John Mill Memorial Lecture for the Biennial Conference of 2021. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I'm 
making this presentation from a lockdown Melbourne instead of being with you in Longreach. I was very much uh, looking forward to participation in person at the conference, uh, but the fates have conspired against us on this occasion. And I look forward to other occasions to, to get out onto uh, that splendid open country. It's my honor to give this lecture uh, in, in honor of Professor John Milne, who contributed so much to global knowledge of the rangelands and to global knowledge of the Australian rangelands. Uh, we miss John, uh, and is deeply missed by many of his friends and colleagues who will participate in this meeting. I'm going to talk about how the changes brought about by climate change and the movement to a zero emissions economy are changing the prospects for life and economic activity in the Australian rangelands. I'll focus especially uh, on the Eastern Australian rangelands and the northern part of those rangelands, but many of my remarks will have wider significance. Climate change is a great blow uh, to uh, Australian uh, rural economy generally, but especially to southern Australia. Uh, its effects in the north are much more mixed. On the other hand, climate change mitigation, the movement to a zero emissions global economy can provide a huge boost to the Australian rural economy and especially to the Northern Australian rangelands. Climate change means less rain and more evaporation in, in Southern Australia. That's a big blow. Climate change on average means more rain in Northern Australia, Australia north of Capricorn, some parts of the inland south of Capricorn as well. Not all of the Queensland coast, uh, some of the, the Northeast uh, because of local geographic circumstances will not experience additional rainfall with climate change. But greater rainfall is the, nor the norm uh, for the rangelands of the inland uh, north of Capricorn we will have much higher evaporation in the warmer and drier climates of Southern Australia, but, but higher rainfall and cloud cover mean that there will not always be substantially greater evaporation in Northern Australia. The great boost to uh, development prospects uh, in Northern Australia will come from the increased value of carbon in soils and plants and the increased value of biomass in industrial production. Biomass will have to um, replace uh, the oil, <clears throat> coal and gas that we currently use in plastics and many industrial processes. That will mean that countries with opportunities for growing more of it uh, will have an opportunity for expanded economic activity. And this new source of income and wealth, especially the sale of biomass for industrial activities will be especially valuable in those parts of the world uh, with exceptionally high quality solar and wind resources, renewable energy resources, which happen to be uh, rural and provincial Australia. Maybe most of the climate change that will occur, most of the temperature increase, uh, which drives everything else, has already happened. The majority of the warming will have already happened uh, if the world succeeds in the Paris objectives of holding temperature increases to less than two degrees but, uh, above uh, pre-industrial levels and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees. The IPCC report a month or so ago uh, showed us that uh, average global 
temperature is now increased by about 1.1 degree above um, pre-industrial levels. It's not uniform all over the Earth's surface and the increase over the land of Australia is on average about 1.4 degrees. If the world succeeds in meeting the Paris objectives, then Australian temperature increases will be held below about two degrees. Failure at Paris would see very much higher increases in temperature. And that will turn out to be catastrophic for rural Southern Australia and problematic for Northern Australia. Next month in Glasgow, we've got the most important meeting of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of the Parties that we've had since the Paris Agreement in December 2015. What happens at Glasgow will determine whether the Paris objectives are going to be met. There is a present strong momentum towards the Paris goals uh, right through the developing world with only one country not committed to the sorts of emissions reductions that are necessary to make Paris work. Australia is the exception, the only developing country, the only developed country at this stage outside that global momentum. A big question is, will we punch above our weight in Glasgow and stall momentum in climate change mitigation? If we do, that will be catastrophic for rural and provincial Australia, especially for the economies of those regions, but in many other ways as well. Carbon sequestered in the land and grown in the land in a renewable way uh, to replace uh, fossil sources of carbon and hydrocarbon is going to be crucial to success with the Paris objectives. Uh, a, a little known fact is that carbon in soils and plants has 2.5 times the, the mass of carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, the, therefore, the leverage of uh, increases in soil and plant carbon over uh, carbon in the atmosphere is considerable. The IPCC a few years ago told us that uh, land carbon, sequestering of carbon in land, land can contribute 37% of emissions reductions required for the two degree objective. The IPCC at the same time said that uh, sequestration of carbon in the land uh, can uh, create enough negative emissions to make 1.5 degrees possible. The US Academy of Sciences uh, in 2017 said that one third of the reductions uh, in emissions required by 2030 for two degrees can come from the land sector. The US Academy said that one fifth of the reductions by 2050 can come from land. So what happens in the land sector is crucial to the climate change outcomes. Australia is by far the best endowed developed country for land carbon. Most important driver of that is our exceptionally large amount of woodlands per capita. A lot of the uh, land uh, has relatively uh, sparse vegetation uh, and relatively uh, small opportunity for expanding it. But many hectares with low carbon per hectare means immense quantities. And on a global scale, this can matter a lot. The Australian plant species are adapted to a variable and hot climate and suitable for sustainable harvesting in these sorts of climates. Combined with renewable energy resources, which are abundant in rural and provincial Australia, this can mean a new source of industrial advantage in the international economy. Uh, an advantage uh, when biomass, renewable biomass, will have to replace oil and gas and coal in industry. And it's especially valuable, the biomass, when you can combine it with low cost renewable energy. And Australia 
has the best combinations of solar and wind energy in the developed world. I'd like to put up half a dozen maps that uh, uh, describe very broadly uh, the, the, opportunity, the opportunity. Uh, figure one it shows uh, the wind resources of Eastern Australia. And you'll see that away from the coast, uh, uh, especially where there's some upland, uh, the wind resources are exceptionally good. Uh, this is a resource of considerable quality, uh, of considerable value in the zero emissions economy. What makes that more valuable and more unusual is that it's closely associated uh, with exceptionally good um, solar resources. Once you get away from the coasts, uh, where uh, solar energy uh, um, generation is uh, vulnerable to cyclonic impact uh, and also uh, reduced by cloud cover. Uh, once you get a few hundred kilometers from the coast, and Northern Australia, especially uh, the land near and south of Capricorn, has about the best solar insulation in Australia, um, figure two. Uh, illustrates that point. The next map uh, shows uh, Australian precipitation, which of course is a very big determinant of what's going to be possible uh, in growing of biomass. Uh, right at the center, uh, we've got country so dry that uh, uh, strong growth in, in biomass is not going to be possible and sequestration of, of uh, uh, carbon in, in soils and plants uh, uh, will be of limited uh, impact. Uh, but there are large parts of uh, uh, Eastern Australia between that very dry inland and the, the, the wetter coasts in, in which you've got substantial uh, rainfall that can support considerable growth of biomass. Another resource in the zero emissions world economy is something that's simply a pest in the old economy. Invasive species like prickly acacia across much of northern Australian rangelands uh, can be uh, harvested and not sustainably. We want to eradicate it, but in the process of eradication, we can generate some value, at least offsetting the costs by uh, converting it into valuable renewable biomass. Uh, for example, by use of, uh, uh, of the prickly acacia biomass for pyrolysis, producing char and bio oil, um, using mobile machines that can go out into the country uh, where the, the trees are growing. Uh, figure four uh, shows the distribution of prickly acacia, huge concentrations in large areas, uh, more than 22 million hectares so uh, quite heavy infestation uh, across Queensland extending into Northern Territory uh, um, around the Tropic of Capricorn. Figure five illustrates how rainfall changes are going to accompany climate change. Uh, on Average uh, global precipitation is going to increase with, with uh, warming. Uh, there'll be more evaporation from the oceans all over, all over the earth, uh, more uh, water vapor in the atmosphere on average, heavier precipitation. But changes in wind patterns mean that the regional distribution of those changes will be highly uneven. Southern Australia is getting much drier and will get very much drier still as temperatures increase. Most of Northern Australia is getting wetter. Uh, what figure five does is uh, for, uh, uh, for Queensland, uh, show uh, changes in precipitation between the years 1916 and 1975 and 1975, is about the time when uh, we started to see 
uh, um, accelerating increases in temperature. The differences between that and the two decades to 2015, 1996 to 2015. Uh, and you'll see that uh, there are parts of um, northern uh, inland uh, Queensland with, with uh, rainfall increases of a couple of hundred millimetres, uh, significant increases through most of inland northern Queensland, not in the south, uh, and not in all coastal areas where local uh, geographic influences on wind patterns uh, can lead to some reduction in precipitation, even when the average in the north is rising. Uh, the, the years I've taken only illustrate the very beginnings of the process because um, on average between 1996 and 2015, we, we had much less of that uh, 1.4 degrees that Australia has experienced. Uh, we've had a lot more since then and it will continue, but figure five makes the point. Figure six, I've just uh, reminded us of the, the bioregions of, of Queensland. Uh, and I'll make brief reference to some of these uh, as we proceed. The, the um, regional options um, for uh, increased economic activity in the zero emissions world economy differ across the bioregions. In the Mali and Mulga country, Mali further south, the Mulga uh, through much of uh, uh, of Western Queensland, uh, especially the, the southern half of the state, create opportunities for sustainable harvest of planted biomass for oils and pyrolysis. Um, in in uh, some places, especially in the West Australian wheat belt, we're starting to see uh, that um, uh, the, the planting of mallee as, as providing windbreaks and shade for moisture retention on the land uh, and um, in improvements in animal productivity, uh, but also providing a sustain potentially sustainable source uh, of biomass. Uh, regular harvesting uh, from the uh, regrowth uh, is, is possible uh, more or less indefinitely within well-managed systems. There are different opportunities in the Mitchell grass plains, the extensive areas um, around Longwheat Reach and extending a long way uh, to the west. Uh, there, there's an immense opportunity for uh, storing carbon in the soils, simply from uh, managing uh, the, the pasture more sustainably uh, and allowing the uh, restoration of, uh, uh, of uh, old um, wealth of, of root systems will very substantially increase carbon. That should be rewarded uh, for its contribution to absorption of carbon. It's not under the current rules, but in a rational system uh, designed to uh, provide incentives for environmentally and economically efficient um, progress towards the Paris goals, it would be. Uh, I think we have to work towards the rational system of carbon um, re reward uh, that would encourage that. Uh, with, within the Mitchell grass, um, there needs to be a lot more research on what's possible, but amongst the possibilities must be with, with uh, proper uh, selection of species and, and uh, effective management based on research, introduction of, of some uh, uh, tree species as windbreaks, uh, for, again, with advantages for um, moisture retention and uh, uh, and um, uh, shade for animals, uh, and uh, potentially uh, an additional source of growth of, of carbon uh, to uh, uh, complement the very large contributions that can be made uh, from the Mitchell grass roots in the soils. Different again in the desert uplands. Uh, uh, which begin 100 kilometers or so uh, to, the, to the east of, um, uh, of uh, Longreach at Bakulden, uh, where uh, there's opportunities for more diverse uh, planting of, of trees, uh, 
uh, for uh, carbon sequestration and, and sustainable biomass, possibly with biodiversity credits if we have um, the uh, right incentive structures in place. Um, the, the new uh, global economy, which values carbon and penalizes uh, the presence of carbon in products, will add new value to the value stack, stack for economic activity on the rangelands. One source of value will be carbon in soils. A second will be carbon in plants. A third will be biomass for industry. Uh, there'll be some value, at least uh, compensation for eradication uh, in the biomass uh, from invasive species. There'll be some value from seeds, oils, and feed uh, from the, the new, new plantings. All of this on top of uh, value from traditional products, uh, much of which could actually be enhanced uh, by utilizing uh, the uh, opportunities to put more carbon in the soil and in plants. Um, we had the uh, opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to examine some of the possibilities um, in a project with which I'm associated uh, uh, through my, the company uh, of which I'm a director, uh, Sunshot Industries, working uh, with the Barcaldon Regional Council and the uh, RAPAD uh, group of of regional councils in developing uh, a model uh, zero emissions industrial precinct for Barcaldon. Uh, at the core of the model is an industrial precinct providing a, a, a wide range of basic services for industry, including low cost power, globally competitive power, much more competitive than is available in the big cities of the coast. Uh, from the first class solar and wind resource uh, provided uh, uh, with um, uh, baseload augmentation, some firming uh, from bio oil used in a steam turbine. Uh, the precinct, uh, we're, we're working towards it hosting uh, protected horticulture using renewable energy to control temperature and renewable carbon dioxide for um, acceleration of plant growth. Uh, we're working towards introduction of hydrogen electrolysis from renewable energy to produce ammonia. Um, the ammonia will be used uh, to produce urea when complemented by renewable carbon dioxide. Um, of course, you use a lot of uh, energy uh, for uh, the production of the urea from ammonia, and that will be generated uh, from local solar and wind resources. We'll have systems in place for producing char and bio oil by pyrolysis, at first from prickly acacia from the region, and then from uh, sustainably harvested uh, plants of other kinds. The bio oil uh, produced from pyrolysis will be combusted in the oxygen waste from the hydrolysis that produces the hydrogen uh, to run the steam turbine. And that will give us renewable carbon dioxide to go back into the uh, protected horticulture and the production of urea. Uh, the fact that we have these services uh, will means that um, seven or eight other relatively small but significant businesses uh, uh, see advantage in locating in the precinct, taking advantage of the availability of, uh, um, uh, of biomass, uh, of uh, uh, low cost renewable energy and other services. <coughs> in the Bark Holden model, uh, char for soil and animal productivity uh, will come uh, from the pyrolysis the char can reduce ruminant emissions, effectively converting methane emissions into increased meat or wool, or in Southern Australia, milk, and generating negative emissions because once uh, placed on the ground or excreted uh, by a, a cow or a sheep, uh, it will remain there for hundreds, uh, probably thousands of years. Uh, the urea 
is used in, in the Central West as a protein supplement. Uh, and uh, uh, not much used yet as a fertilizer. It may be more in future, but certainly in demand for a fertilizer in the central highlands of Queensland. Uh, jar and urea together could become a source of slow release fertilizer, uh, protecting waterways in the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon uh, from uh, nitrogenous fertilizer runoff. There are some barriers to uh, rangelands rejuvenation. <laughs> One is that Australia's status as a laggard in global climate policies uh, keeps it out of the global discussion of the shape of trading in carbon intensive products uh, and uh, um, carbon credits. That's, that's a big loss for us. Uh, Australia is vulnerable to trade exclusion, including for carbon credits and zero carbon goods. We're a laggard on public research on the new opportunities. We're a laggard on fiscal support for innovation. We're a laggard on domestic carbon markets. <coughs> there are some problems with our current land carbon market. The emissions reduction fund methodologies do not systematically relate to accretion and de depletion of carbon in plants and soils. Ad additionality measures are subjective. We rely on shallow markets dependent on the Commonwealth budget without links to the international market. Prices are a fraction, a small fraction of the true value of carbon sequestration and the price for carbon, for example, in the European Union. And our systems have very high measurement costs, increasing difficulties, especially for small producers getting into it. Uh, the remedies <coughs> for land carbon markets um, are built around a concept of, that I've developed of comprehensive carbon accounting, where you don't have the microcosmic methodologies, you simply measure carbon in the soil and the plants in a baseline, and then periodically remeasure it and systematically and comprehensively reward accretions of carbon and uh, penalize depletion. Uh, with comprehensive carbon accounting, you need to set the baseline with integrity, uh, but that can't be done. I talked about it in my uh, recent book, uh, uh, Reset, Restoring Australia After the Pandemic Recession, uh, which followed on from my book a couple of years ago, Superpower, Australia's Low, Low Carbon Opportunities. Both books have chapters uh, on the land carbon opportunity. Uh, the, the, the remedies in the, in the uh, land carbon markets will have to include some opportunity for insurance against uh, uh, effects of climatic fluctuations in, um, uh, on carbon stocks that can be done. Um, the remedies more generally for blockages to rangelands restoration uh, are centered on Australia embracing the, the global movement towards zero emissions. Once we embrace it as something that has to be done and something that can be very valuable for us if we do it well, uh, then a lot of other things will follow. We'll need to commit ourselves not only to net zero emissions by 2050, but to 50% reduction in emissions from a 2005 base by 2030. That will allow us to participate in shaping the international rules on land carbon trade. It would encourage us to recognize the opportunity and to provide more support for innovation and com commercialization of the, the new zero emissions technologies. And it would encourage us uh, to put in place the high levels of public research, which are necessary uh, on carbon value in the rangelands. Australia built agriculture and the pastoral industries on basic research in the State Departments of Agriculture, in the old universities, and the CSIRO in its uh, first half century or so. We've tended to underplay, undervalue uh, public research uh, in the rural economy 
uh, in the last uh, quarter century. Uh, correcting that is, uh, uh, is going to be very important uh, in removing the blockages uh, for uh, Rangelands Australia doing well in the zero emissions world economy. Thank you very much, Professor Garno. It's wonderful to see you again. And um, uh, those with their eagle eyes will note that uh, your presentation was recorded, uh, but you are now joining us live and it's wonderful to see you. It's a shame not to see you in the Central West, uh, but we do know you can't change your jacket and shirt quite that quickly. <laughs> Um, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. And some questions are coming in already through our live Q&A. The first question I'll put to you is from Robin Cowley. She would like to know if soil carbon storage on degraded Mitchell grasslands becomes an approved methodology, will there be accounting for loss of carbon on land that is degraded elsewhere outside of approved C projects? Well, I want us to get away from micro methodologies uh, towards a comprehensive carbon accounting in which we would uh, establish baselines with integrity and then measure comprehensively movements away from that. So we'd see inclusion of the Mitchell grass uh, country, uh, but... Um, uh, but, but not through the development of a specific methodology, but uh, uh, through the adoption of a general comprehensive carbon accounting. Uh, in the proposal, as I've developed it, um, I, I'd uh, make entry into uh, the arrangements voluntary. But if you did enter, you would have to accept responsibility reciprocal obligations, uh, uh, you would have to accept responsibility for, for any loss of carbon. Uh, on average, the opportunity will be there for very large uh, uh, value to be created in the Mitchell grass country. Uh, I've uh, visited the, uh, uh, the, the old research uh, station at uh, uh, at long reach and the Department of Agriculture there and um, uh, seen the profiles of the the carbon in the soils it's magnificent uh, and uh, there, there used to be huge stocks of carbon in the soils which uh, with with uh, overgrazing uh, have been depleted restoration of that could be a huge source of wealth if it was rewarded as it should be uh, for the contribution it makes to the zero uh, net emissions e economy. Uh, but uh, I would make entry into the arrangements voluntary uh, that would require uh, acceptance of responsibility for depletion. Now, there will be circumstances in which, for example, extreme drought over a long period would lead to uh, depletion uh, uh, independently of management uh, methods. And so, uh, uh, I would like the arrangements to include uh, forms of averaging and insurance, uh, but, but that can all be done. Okay. And now next question comes from Geoffrey N. He wants to know, with increased biomass comes an increased risk of bushfires, which recent history shows we don't address well. How do we manage this? He'd like to know. First thing we do is address it well. Uh, we haven't uh, given our uh, vulnerability to bushfire and more in southern Australia than northern Australia uh, uh, it, it's at first sight surprising we haven't put more scientific effort into uh, a development of better systems for managing vulnerability to bushfires but but we do need um, more research we need need, need uh, more active management um, uh, uh, application of knowledge uh, will lead us to uh, uh, plant uh, uh, trees differently. And there are some species that are uh, much less vulnerable to uh, bushfires than others. Uh, for example, the, the Australian eucalypt is notoriously uh, vulnerable to bushfire. It, it's an ecosystem that, that grew around uh, the presence of fire. And uh, in some ways, um, 
uh, is particularly uh, uh, vulnerable to it, but uh, but particularly uh, uh, dependent on periodic fires in in some ecosystems. Uh, but there are other species that aren't. One of the interesting species is the Mexican desert plant, the uh, agave, uh, which is particularly uh, uh, um, uh, um, invulnerable to uh, to fire. Uh, that could could have a role in uh, uh, in generating value. It also has the advantages that uh, uh, it can uh, uh, survive through uh, much more severe droughts than uh, we're used to in the long reach uh, area of, uh, of Australia. Uh, it won't die and then it will flourish, uh, put on a, a lot of uh, mass uh, when water is available. Uh, so it, it would do very well in a variable uh, um, environment. It's not vulnerable to uh, bushfire in the same way as the eucalypt. So we we need more thinking, we need more research, we need more systematic application of knowledge to management systems. And Professor Garno, one thing I have just learnt about the uh, agave plant is it's the key ingredient in tequila. Uh, yes, it is, and there's a global shortage of it. Uh, Mexican tequila producers uh, uh, have run out of uh, 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 um, agave stock locally. Uh, so, so, so that's that's a bit of a byproduct from it. Something we'll have to discuss next time you're in town while we sample some. Our next question comes from uh, Angus White. He'd like to know, would it be possible to put together a simple annual carbon account uh, respecting a emissions and sequestration on a property level? Yes, it is possible and it is being done. Uh, uh, there's a, a very interesting and uh, I think it will be an important institution being established through a, a large philanthropic donation uh, by a West Australian businessman, Norman Pater, uh, the Carbon Farming Foundation is called, that's uh, uh, helping uh, 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 owners of properties uh, to do that amongst other things. Yeah, yes, it is possible. What we need is uh, lower cost uh, and simpler systems of measurement we need a lot of research to uh, generate the, those. Um, they will be, especially for the vast uh, distances that we uh, uh, encounter in the rangelands of Australia, uh, we, we, we need uh, uh, remote sensing techniques using drones and satellites uh, rather than uh, laboriously taking uh, uh, samples of, uh, uh, of, of soils and measuring trees. Uh, uh, the good news is that uh, quite a lot of work is being done on that in the world, but especially in Australia. Uh, the improvement in lowering the cost of uh, uh, measurement of carbon in soils is one of the five technologies uh, that were uh, given prominence in the Commonwealth Government's uh, technology roadmap uh, that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, that needs to be extend, extended uh, from soils to plants as well uh, and uh, reducing the cost through uh, uh, remote measurement techniques uh, is going to be very important to uh, uh, measuring carbon cheaply at the uh, farm or station level. Thank you, Professor Gunno. And just for those who are playing at home, uh, you'll notice the questions are coming up in the live Q&A. One feature I didn't mention earlier was that you can like the questions. So if you've had a question on the tip of your tongue and you haven't asked it yet, have a look. Someone may have asked it already and you can like that question and it will let us know that that is uh, a question that more than one person would like answered. So, for example, John Lees has asked... Um, and, and his question has just gone up to seven people would like me to ask that one. He asks, the losses of carbon will mainly occur in droughts by vegetation death and soil erosion. Can you explain, Professor Garno, your comment about how a participant in the scheme would ensure against these losses at a time of economic stress on landholders? Yes, uh, I... Uh... I, as part of a comprehensive uh, a movement towards comprehensive carbon accounting, I, you would make provision for uh, uh, for purchase of uh, insurance uh, 
uh, which, uh, well, would in practice uh, involve putting aside uh, some of the uh, the the, the, the uh, rewards from increasing carbon in good times for balancing the bad times, like like any form of insurance, uh, uh, the the availability of it in a bad time wouldn't depend on the exact time at which you'd purchase the insurance. We, uh, a lot of work has to be done on design of this. It's an important part of putting together the overall commercial system uh, for expansion of. Um, of, uh, of uh, the, the role of uh, uh, carbon credits in the rural economy, but uh, uh, that, that's what I mean um, by insurance. Okay. Matthew Wheeler would like to know, is it possible to increase land carbon storage in the rangelands at the same time as ensuring that natural ecosystems and biodiversity is maintained? Yes, I think it's very important that we do that. Um, uh, in the Mitchell grass country, uh, uh, restoring the health of the old biosystems, the old ecosystems, is is the core of what we need to do. Um, uh, I, as you know, uh, Nicola spent a bit of time uh, uh, in the, uh, the the central west in recent times, and um, uh, I'm familiar with uh, landowners uh, who have been able to increase. Uh, uh, productivity uh, uh, output of uh, output of meat uh, by uh, uh, re restoring Mitchell grass uh, uh, long uh, rotations that uh, allow uh, uh, recovery of root systems and as well as uh, uh, the, the the mass of plant ab above the soil and uh, avoiding uh, running. Uh, the, the plants right down so that uh, the, 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 the roots um, shrivel. So uh, 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 doing that in a biodiverse uh, way uh, w w will uh, have, uh, will be particularly advantageous in terms of um, uh, uh, land and soil productivity. Uh, in addition, I think there's a place for um, uh, governments to encourage the biodiversity through biodiversity credits. Uh, the Queensland government is, has made provision for that through the Land Restoration Fund. It's in its early days, but uh, I think it could play a big role. And the Commonwealth government, uh, uh, through the uh, Minister for Agriculture, uh, is is looking at uh, 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 introduction of uh, biodiversity credits. If they're available on top of rewards for carbon, it will avoid what otherwise would be a risk, just going flat out on uh, uh, producing whatever plants uh, give you the biggest carbon value uh, and ignoring the, uh, the benefits of biodiversity. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions before um, this session ends. Andrew Ash would like to know, or I guess he makes an assertion here, have you painted an overly positive picture of rainfall increases in the north because of rain, because rainfall variability is also increasing? The dry periods will get more intense and be punctuated by bigger and more extreme wet events, which can cause significant challenges. Uh, I, in, in my work in general, I certainly don't uh, uh, underplay the increased variability. Yes, we a higher proportion of rain we may get in most of northern Australia, as I said, not not the Queen, not necessarily the Queensland coast uh, and the Great Divide, but uh, further to the west, uh, uh, it, 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 uh, north of Capricorn, uh, we, we are likely to get substantially uh, higher average rain, but it will be, will come more in uh, uh, in concentrated bursts uh, and uh, uh, we, that will uh, mean we will have to adjust uh, uh, um, the, the way we manage our land. I have to give more thought to uh, storing uh, feed uh, from the good times to take us through the bad times. Uh, we'll have to uh, give special attention to plants uh, that can flourish in the good times uh, and not die in the bad times. Uh, so uh, uh, increased variability of rain will uh, uh, present challenges uh, 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 which uh, knowledge uh, from research can help us to overcome. 
Okay, and time for one final question. This one from Stuart B. He wants to know, will there be a role of herbaceous plants, such as legumes, to boost biomass production, to supply nitrogen, to increase grass growth, and hence carbon sequestration? Yes, I think so. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, we've done too little research on this in the rangelands, but... Uh, uh, but but uh, uh, there is evidence that uh, uh, th that uh, uh, the fixing of, uh, uh, of of nitrogen through legumes uh, can can uh, uh, assist other plant growth in in the rangelands as in other ecosystems. So uh, uh, that that thinking through uh, those relationships is a very important part of building a prosperous future in the zero emissions economy. Well, Professor Gunner, thank you so much for joining us from Melbourne and we look forward uh, to seeing you back in your home away from home in the Central West in the Rangelands region. Um, uh, also from Melbourne, we're joined by Shamila is in Melbourne and so is Heather. We've got people from all over Hay, Broken Hill, Renmark, Darwin and Warwick uh, to name a few. We're going to take a break now on this session We'll be back online in another two minutes. Thank you for your time and we'll see you back for session two at 9.25.